we start? الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى today we're going to talk about the life of a great man شيخ الإسلام ابن تيمية رحمه الله but we won't be able to give Shaykh al-Islam justice, to be very honest and fair. In one gathering, two, three, he's a, a masterpiece. Rahimahullah, his own student, the great historian, Ibn al-Qayyim al jawziyah he said about him, he said, Ibn Taymiyyah is higher for my speech to give him justice. My words cannot really describe this man. Oh, or even my pen to describe who and what type of person he was. And as we shed some light on his life, you're going to agree with this, inshallah ta'ala. The Arabs, they say a lot. يَكْفِي مِنَ الْقِلَادَةِ مَا أَحَاطَ بِالْعُنُقِ Inshallah ta'ala we will take what is بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ الْكَرِيمِ appropriate from his life. Okay? So we start by saying his name, inshallah ta'ala. His name is Abu al-Abbas Taqiyuddin Ahmed ibn Abdul Halim ibn Abdul Salam ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Qasim al-Khadir. He's known as, very well known as Ibn Taymiyyah. That's the name he's become known for. And also he is known as Shaykh al-Islam. He is known as what? Shaykh al-Islam. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, as it was mentioned from his own student, Abu, Abu, Abu Hafs al-Bazzar, he said that he was born in a place called Harran. Ibn Taymiyyah was born in a place called what? He was born in Harran when it was the 10th of Rabi' al-Awwal. That's when he was born. And he was born... When the year was Ihda wa Sitina wa Sitimia, he was born 661 Hijriya. And he stayed in that place, Harran, for 10 years. And then his parents, they moved him from Harran to a place called Dimashq. Dimashq. And the reason why they took him to Dimashq was because the Tatar. Inshallah ta'ala, if we get time, we're going to shed light, some light on who they were. They were entering Harran, the place that the Sheikh was born. So his family had to run and leave Harran because they were scared of the Tatar coming in and harming them. And Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, okay, his father was a scholar and his granddad was even a bigger scholar. So he's from a family of knowledge. So the day they were leaving from Harran, the day that they were leaving from Harran, his father put all of the books and all of the works that they had on a... Uh, on their riding beast and they left and for, sh for him Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah he could already see that there were a people who were transgressive a people who were yani, uh, evil from uh, the age of 10 he saw what type of people they were if they're taking him and his family and all of the people of the land out of this land it put something in the Shaykh's mind rahimahullah so he left Harran and he stayed in what? Dimashq. He grew up in Dimashq, rahimahullah. 
and he spent a good time of his life in there. Um, rahimahullahu rahmatan wasi'a. Let's talk about some of the appearance of the shaykh. What kind? How do he look like? The scholars they mention the description of the shaykh rahimahullah was. He had characteristics that you would rarely find in someone. Honey, somebody might have a few of these characteristics. But for all of these characteristics to be in one person, it was it's quite t- taking back. So it took the people back that he had some of these, all these traits present in him. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Which is, number one, he had si'atu ilm. He was vast in his knowledge. This is something he had. He was, the first quality that he had, is his knowledge was extremely vast. Rahimahullah rahmatan wasi'a. The knowledge he had was something, this is number one, this is his first description, okay, is that he was excessively knowledgeable, rahimahullah ta'ala. If you saw him, you would know that this man is talking with knowledge. And this is something the people who loved him and the people that hated him, they all acknowledged. It was a consensus amongst, amongst them all. Ibn Daqiq al Eid, who is a faqih shafi'i, he's one of the great shafi'i scholars, and he has a, the best explanation on the kitab Umdatul Ahkam, Ibn Daqiq al Eid. And if you read that book, you'll see how much knowledge he has. He said about Ibn Taymiyyah when he saw him. He said, Laqad ijtama'tu bibn Taymiyyah. He said, Me and Ibn Taymiyyah, we came together. He said, Ra'aytu rajulan, I saw a man. All of the knowledge is in front of his eyes. He chooses what he wants to take. The knowledge is in front of him. Just like somebody's reading from a book and saying this from here and here. He, from memory, everything was right in front of him. He will take what he wanted and he would dismiss what he wanted. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Ibn Daqiq was very older than Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. And the time that he said this, that he meant he met Ibn Taymiyyah was the time Ibn Taymiyyah rushed from Dimashq to come to Egypt because Ibn Dikhik al-Eid was in Egypt. He came to Egypt, Ibn Taymiyyah, and the reason why he came to Egypt was because he was requesting for an army to come and help the Muslims in Dimashq against the Tatar. So he sat, sat, stood there in front of the ruler and the, the Qadi, the judge at that time, the supreme judge, okay, was Ibn Daqiq al Eid. So he's sitting there and he listened. Ibn Taymiyyah sat there and he brought out every verse in the Quran that spoke about jihad, fi sabilillah. Every verse, one after the other, went through all of them, all the verses. When he finished the verses, he started from the ahadith of the Prophet and read what the time could allow him. Rahimahullah. When he finished that, he started to make all the ayat and the hadith he's talking about is the virtues of jihad. Then he went through the ahkam of, of it. Rahimahullah. He went through the ahkam uh, and the rulings of al-jihad and the ruling that it has right now, what you guys have to do. Rahimahullah, rahmatan wasi'a. Ibn Daqiq was taken by surprise. This man, the way he talks, the way he speaks, the way he argues, the way he brings his points forward. Amazing. Another scholar who praised his knowledge is Ibn Sayyid al-Nas al-Yahsubi. Ibn Sayyid al-Nas he himself was a scholar. Each person who praised him, if you knew who they were, you would say, wow, is that what they said about Ibn Taymiyyah? But I can't explain to you Ibn Taymiyyah and also tell you the person who spoke about him every time I get. But Ibn Sayyid al-Nas is one of the great scholars. He said about Ibn Taymiyyah, min al hadda. What I've seen from this man is that he has, he has knowledge. He has a large portion of knowledge. وَكَادَ يَسْتَوْعِبُ السُّنَنَ وَالْآثَارِ حِفْظًا And he said, Ibn Taymiyyah is close to saying, I memorize all the Qur'an and all the hadiths and everything in it. Close. The reason why he can't say, Ibn Taymiyyah memorized all of the hadith, because that's impossible. No one has, in history has memorized all the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. No one. And Imam Shafi'i, he said he's a liar, anyone who claims that he has memorized all of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Lakin Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Sayyid al Nasiyah, he said, Wakada yastaw ibu sunana wal athara hivran. He has all the ahadith, not just a hadith, 
The Sunan and the Athar. Athar is what? The statements of the Ashabas and the Tabi'een. He knew it from memory. Rahimahullah. Look what he said. In takallama fi tafsiri. If Ibn Taymiyyah talks about a matter in tafsir, فَهُوْ حَمِّنُ رَايَتِهِ He's like he's carrying the banner for it. If he speaks about tafsir, you would think to yourself, he's the mufassir. There's no other mufassir in, in history. أَوْ أَفْتَى فِي الْفِقْرِ Or if he opens his mouth and he talks about an issue in fiqh, فَهُوْ مُدْرِكُ غَايَتِهِ He reached the ending of it. أَوْ ذَاكَرَ الْحَدِيثِ If he mentions a hadith or talks about a hadith now, you will say there was no other scholar in hadith except him. He said about him, فَهُوَ صَاحِبُ عِلْمٍ وَذُو الْرِوَايَةِ He had knowledge and he had narrations. Also about him, أَوْ حَاضَرَ He also had what? بِالنِّحَلِ وَالْمِلَنِ all the groups and the sects in Islam, where they started, where they came from, not only that. He also knew all the groups that were not Muslims, the Christians, the Jews, all the groups. He knew it from memory. He has a kitab called Al Jawab al Sahih, Liman Bedda Ladin al Masih, where he talks about all the Christians and the Jews. Specifically focuses on the Christian in that book. He goes through the Rafid and the Shia in a kitab, he called it Minhaj al Sunnah Nabawiya. He wrote another kitab called Ta'sis. No, he called it Daru Ta'arud al aql wal Naqal, where he went through all the philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, all of them. And then after I went to Ibn, uh, Ibn Sina and uh, Al-Farabi and uh, uh, all of the philosophers within Islam. He knew every single one of them. Rahimahullah. That's the type of person he was. Look what Ibn Sayyidina said about him. لم يرى أوسع من نحلتي في ذلك ولا أرفع من درايتي برز في كل فن. Every science Ibn Taymiyyah was the same to him. He didn't believe in this concept of I specialized in this. He specialized in everything. رحمه الله. برز في كل فن على أبناء جنسي. The people of his time, he wasn't living with them. He was far ahead of them. رحمه الله. وَلَمْ تَرَ عَيْنٌ No eyes have has seen, he said, from amongst us. وَلَمْ تَرَ عَيْنٌ مَرَّا مِثْلَهُ No one has ever seen someone like this man. وَلَا رَأَتْ عَيْنُهُ مِثْلَ نَفْسِهِ He himself did not see someone like him. Even he hasn't seen someone like himself. That's the statement of people who loved him. What about the people who hated him? From the people who hated the shaykh, hated him greatly, was a man by the name of Kamaluddin ibn Zamlakani. Ibn Zamlakani hated Ibn Taymiyyah. He was one of Ibn Taymiyyah's worst enemies. He used to give fatwa for Ibn Taymiyyah to be arrested and to, put, to be put behind bars. Look what he said about him. The scholars back then, they had fairness. The issue that we have is something else. But they didn't lie about what the person was. They, he said about him. Kana. He was. إِذَا سُئِلَ عَنْ فَنِّنْ If anyone asked Ibn Taymiyyah about a matter, مِنَ الْعِلْمِ in a knowledge, he didn't, he, didn't want to, he didn't restrict it to a particular science. He said, any issue you asked Ibn Taymiyyah, the one who's looking and the one who's listening will think to themselves, that Ibn Taymiyyah doesn't know anything except that. If Ibn Taymiyyah talked about matter, you would think to yourself, this is his field of expertise. You would think this is the one he knows, this is what he specialized in. And then you ask him another issue, you say, no, no, that's not what he specialized. He specialized in this one. And then if he talks about something else, you think he specialized in this one. That's what he said. That's what he said. Look what, after what he said. وَكَانَ الْفُقَهَا The jurists, the fuqaha of Ibn Taymiyyah's time, from the Hanafiyyah, the Malikiyyah, the Shafi'iyyah, the Hanabila, all of them, they used to sit with him to learn their madhab from him. The Hanaf, would go to Ibn Taymiyyah and he would teach them about their madhab. The Maliki would do the same. And uh, the Sheikh, of course, he was originally a what? No, he was a Hanbali. Ibn Taymiyyah, of course, he grew up in the Hanbali madhab. After that, he became a Mujtahidul Mutlaq. He has his own madhab. Huh? He looks at the Quran and the Surah directly himself and extracts the ruling from it. Rahimahullah. That's what he said about him. Ibn Taymiyyah spoke about himself. He said, Ana, I, I know every innovation. 
hadathat fil islam that took place within islam i know every sect every group who innovated in islam i know it wa man ibtada'aha i even know the first person who started it wa ma kana sabab ibtida'iha i even know why he started it and all of this rahimahullah he said this in his majmu' al fatawa the third volume the scholars they said you're right you're telling the truth they saw that in his works and his speech and what he said Ibn al-Qayyim said about him, about Ibn Taymiyyah's knowledge, he was very generous when it came to his knowledge. Very generous. He never kept it to himself. He said, If anybody ever asked him about a mas'ala, Ibn Taymiyyah's tariqah was what? He will just go. He will just write. Ibn Taymiyyah, he was so knowledgeable, rahimahullah ta'ala, that he used to write without looking at what he just wrote. His pen would just keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. When he finishes the paper, he put it away. because He'll just pass it on. Khalas, take it now. They said if the papers were brought back to him, he wouldn't be able to read his own handwriting. He couldn't read his own? His own handwriting. Rahimahullah. As you know, brothers, there are, letter, there are books that today we, we take for, for a week, two weeks to study, right? He wrote it between Dhuhr and Asr. Fi Jalsatin Wahida. There's a three volume book, it's called Kitabu Tis'iniya by Ibn Taymiyyah. Tis'iniya is called three volumes by Shaykh al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. He's, he was in prison. And a man came to him and said to him, They want to speak to you face to face, the ruler. And the Sheikh was in Egypt at this time. He was in prison in Egypt. He said, why does he want to speak to me? He said, because he wants to see your opinion on this issue. Ibn Taymiyyah said, I've spent a good time in prison. Now you want to hear what, I have, what, I, what my view is? After you've imprisoned me for this long? He said, I don't want to debate anybody. I have before, and it never worked for me in Dimashq. I wrote when he debated the Mas'ala Al-Aqidatul al He said, what I'll do is, I'll write something for you. Can you wait for me? Just stand here, I'll write it. And it was related to the issue of Al-Kalamun Nafsi, Allah's speech, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Taymiyyah wrote a three volume, today's published is three volumes, one, two, three, three volumes, Mujalladat. He crossed his legs, took a, he, he dipped his uh, pen into the ink, and he wrote. The reason why it's called Tis'iniyyah is because he responded to this issue from 90 different directions. That's why it's called a tis'iniya. Tis'iniya means 90. Are we all together, brothers? That's the type of person. He was rahimahullah ta'ala. In his knowledge, when you look at it, he's extremely shocking as a person. I have never read the life of someone like that when it comes to knowledge. I've never seen it. The biggest book that's written on his life, taqreeb 500 pages, I read it more than four times. It's called Al-Uqud al-Durriya fi ba'di banaqib shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah. He leaves you with shock. Is this a normal human being? Are we all together? Was this normal? How can someone be like this? It's amazing, it's shocking. He, he was less than 10 years of age. 10, he was less than 10. His family said, come, let's take you, we're going to go and we're going to take you to, uh, we're going to take you out to have, Dimashq was a, was a place known for its greenery. Dimashq was known for greenery. It's not like the Arabian Peninsula. It's not like Al Hijaz. These countries are very desert. Like in Dimashq, it's different. It's green. Very green. Are we all together? So his parents said to him, um, to him come, we take you out. Let's have fun. We're going to take you to the, sea, to the ocean and the sea. We're going to go to the, we're going to have a picnic. He said, I don't want to go. You guys go. Come with us, please. No, no, he said, no, I want to stay, please. So they let him stay. They left him. They came back and they told him, you broke our heart. We were all worrying about you. We, did, we didn't enjoy ourselves because you were not with us. And he said, I benefited from my time. They said, what did you do in that time? He brought out the kitab, Rawdul Nadir wa Junnatul Munadir by Ibn Qudama. And he said, I memorized this book. He brought the book out. That book, brothers, it's taught in the advanced level. Postgraduate students study it. In masters and usul al-fiqh. 
Are we all together, brothers? He said, I memorized it. Not I read it. I memorized it, he said. Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah. That was the type of person he was. Ibn Taymiyyah, as some people might think, he, they think he's restricted to Islamic knowledge. No. He wasn't just, he didn't, he didn't restrict himself to Islamic knowledge. He actually went beyond and above that. He went to other sciences, other knowledge. He looked out for it, rahimahullah ta'ala. Look what was said about him. What, uh, about him. Al-Alama Ahmad ibn Yahya al-Umari, what did he, he say about him? He said, وَكَانَ إِمَامًا فِي التَّفْسِيرِ وَعُلُومُ الْقُرْآنِ He was an imam in it. وَعَارِفًا بِالْفِقْءِ وَاخْتِلَافِ الْفُقَهَاءِ وَالْأُصُولِيِّينَ He knew fiqh and the scholars of fiqh, how they disputed one another. He was an imam in grammar. He would go against Sibawayhi and Khalil Muhammad al-Farahidi, the great imams of the language. He would go against them. That's one of the reasons why him and Abu Hayyan and Andalusi, they fought. He said, I know a hundred masail, a hundred issues in Nahu. See the way he got it wrong. He doesn't know he got it wrong. You don't know Abu Hayyan and Andrusi that he got it wrong. And Abu Hayyan really loved Ibn Taymiyyah before that. And as soon as he said that, he got angry. Now are you talking about see the way he like that? A hundred issues. Imagine that. And see the way today is like the father of what? Father of grammar. That was the type of person. See the way his kitab, many people today that we look up to as grammarians don't read kitab See the way his kitab, no one really reads it. Like, it's, just, it's like advanced. It's not just grammar as well. It's phonology, it's morphology, it's syntax. You study their, in, in their semantics, you study in their philology. It's all types of the language. See the kitab. Ibn Taymiyyah qara'ahu, he read it. Wastaw'abahu. And he understood it. And he didn't reach 10 years of age. This was what he was, he was digesting the information. He was taken in before he even reached the age of 10. Rahimahullah. Look what he said then about him. He knew lugha. He knew mantiq. He knew ilmul hay'a. He knew maths very well. Ibn Taymiyyah. Geography. History. All of this he knew it. And anything related to logic. Philosophy, Ibn Taymiyyah swallowed it. Mantiq, he, he swallowed it. He has two books on Mantiq. Read it. The first book he has is called Ar Raddu Al Mantiqiyin. Are we all together? That's one book he writ, wrote. Suyuti came, Jalaluddin Suyuti came and he summarized it. From his books on Mantiq is a kitab known as Intisar al Ahlil Athar. Are we all together? Which is known as Naqdul Mantiq. He wrote those two books. Those two books of his was just one seer. Hafdan. He never believed reference this, quote from this. That was not a part of Ibn Taymiyyah's life. Ibn Taymiyyah wrote what was on his mind. Are we all together, brothers? And later, of course, when people publish books, they're going to go to the references to check if it's there. It's actually there. As he quoted it. Are we all together, brothers? Subhanallah, he was a, a, a shocking individual. The second thing I want to talk about Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, is his memory. How fast he used to memorize things. Rahimahullah. He was powerful in the way that he used to hear things. It was mentioned one day, a man traveled. He traveled to just meet Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah was a kid, going to second primary school and coming back. This man traveled to what? He said to a man, I'm looking for Ibn Taymiyyah. I heard about this boy called Ahmed ibn Abdul Halim. I've heard about him. <laughs> I heard he has photographic memory. He memorizes the things if he sees it once. So I want to see him. The man said, he's not here now, but he's going to take this road. He, he, he comes on this road. Uh, just wait uh, a bit. So the man sat down and he waited for a little bit. He waited for a little bit, Ibn Taymiyyah came. Ibn Taymiyyah was carrying a log, a big log, where he wrote, writes things on. Back then, papers and pen was not the thing, right? He's, he's a young kid, he's got his log. He's walking, and what happens is the man is told, that, that, that's Abdul, uh, Ahmed ibn Abdul Halim that you were asking about, the young boy. He, he calls him, he said, come here. Ibn Taymiyyah came. He said, what is written on there for you? He said, "My, what I was studying. He said, wipe it off. He wiped it off. 
He said, I'm going to give you 10 hadiths. Write them. So he wrote it. Ibn Taymi. He said, look at it. Ibn Taymi looked at it. He said, wipe it off. Right here. Read it to me. He read it. From memory one time. Did not change anything. So the man thought maybe because it's... Uh, huh? He's maybe heard of it before or something. He changed it again. Gave him another one. Another ten. And he, rahimahullah ta'ala, without hata thinking, he read the hadith. And then he said, if this boy lives, he's going to come out with something fascinating. This is what was said about him. وَمِنْ عَجَائِبِ مَا وَقَعَ فِي الْحِفْظِ فِي أَهْلِ زَمَانِنَا They added him to the list of those people who had powerful memorization. Is who? Ibn Taymiyyah. فَإِنَّهُ كَانَ يَمُرُّ بِالْكِتَابِ Ibn Taymiyyah would just read a book. Like, you know how we read? He would read a book. فَيُطَالِعُهُ مَرَّةً He would only read it once. فَيَنْتَقِشُ فِي ذِهْنِهِ It will stick to his head. What he just read will stick to his brain. رحمه الله. And then he would go and he would quote it verbatim, word for word, as it was in there. I used to teach a group of brothers the works of Ibn Taymiyyah a lot. I would teach Al-Wasatiya Al-Hamawiyya and Al-Tadmuriya. Tadmuriya is not his. Al-Wasatiya Al-Hamawiyya, sorry, Al-Wasatiya Al-Hamawiyya, Al-Tadmuriya, and then we go to Al-Sharh Al-Asfahaniya by Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah sometimes, he will quote one of the Imams of Al-Islam. He will say, Qawla Abu Zur'at Al-Razi. Or Qala Darimi. Or Qala Qawamu Sunnah Abu Qasim Al Taymi. Or he would quote somebody. And it would be like four or five pages. And we know that book itself. He wrote it in one sit. One sit. All of this information you've got in your head. Ay na'am. Rahimahullah. That even you to read these quotes, sometimes you're like, Allahu Akbar. All of this, all of this. That was the type of person he was, rahimahullah, when it came to memorization. The third thing I want to mention, I mentioned his knowledge, I mentioned his memorization, I want to mention the third thing, which is how he was, يعني, the endurance Ibn Taymiyyah had for knowledge and also for, for teaching. He loved to read, he loved to memorize, and he loved to revise. He loved it, he enjoyed it, rahimahullah. He never felt that he got yeah, and he full from knowledge. Not at all. He always felt like he wanted to know more. As Safadi said about him, وَكَانَ مِنْ صِغَرِهِ حَرِيصًا عَلَى الطَّلَبِ For as a child, he was eager to learn. He was. مُجِدًّا عَلَى التَّحْسِيرِ وَالدَّعَبِ وَلَا يُؤْثِرُ عَلَى الْإِشْتِغَالِ لَذَّةِ He used the joy that he used to get from knowledge. He believed he never got it from anywhere else. So he never ever, Ibn Taymiyyah, never known to what? To waste his time on what? To waste his time on playing and laughing and joking. He wasn't like that, rahimahullah ta'ala. Number four. Ibn Taymiyyah, a lot of people have knowledge, a lot of people have memorization, of course not of this level, but can you be sharp in your, in your knowledge? Precision is another thing. Memorization is good. Yani studying is also good. But to be a person who gets the matters from where it's required and hit, hit, the, hit the needle as it is, that's what Ibn Taymiyyah had. had Rahimahullah ta'ala. That he was a man, his hujjah, the proof he used to bring was so overwhelming that the person who's listening didn't know what to say. Well, in that case, they say he never went into a debate, and his debates were many. Everybody was, was, was pulling the Sheikh. And they were, it never happened, Ibn Taymiyyah, someone debated him and silenced him. And he didn't know what to say. It's never happened, they said. Rather, the opposite was true. He would overwhelm the person with so much information where they wouldn't know what to say after that. Rahimahullah. He would come from every direction there could possibly be for a person, rahimahullah. The fifth characteristic of his was he was an aesthetic person. He was an aesthetic individual. The Shaykh, rahimahullah, was not a person who the dunya meant anything to him. He didn't run after the dunya and see it to be something. 
ولذلك one of the rulers he said to Ibn Taymiyyah uh, I think you're, you're doing all of this so you can be known and you're doing all of this um, so you can get some recognition or maybe you're looking for power Ibn Taymiyyah said to him and he said Mulkuk wa mulku abika la yusawi indi fil sayn your kingdom and your father's kingdom and all of your kingdom is not equal to me two cents. It means nothing to me. He was not a person who loved يعني, leadership. Rahimahullah. And Imam al Dhabi said about his generosity. Wama ra'aytu fil alam. He said, I never saw in my life akrama minhu, anyone who was more generous than him. Any money that came to him, that someone bought him, he would call his students and the people he knew. He'll say, I know you're struggling. Here, here. Fine. Wherever he had, they all had it with him. That was a quality that he had, rahimahullah ta'ala. The Shaykh, rahimahullah, as you know, he never got married. Never. And nor did he desire to get married. His brain was preoccupied with knowledge and studying and teaching and fighting and all of that. That's what his life was full of. Number six, the sixth quality about this great Imam is his, his uh, hilm. Hilm means his uh, forbearance. He had a high level of tolerance. And with that, he had patience, extreme patience. He would always turn a blind eye from what people would say or do to him. I'm going to mention a few times where that became apparent to the people. Najmuddin, let's, let's just say one of his opponents, okay, they, a lot of the enemies of the Shaykh, rahimahullah, they complained about him because of the fatawa that he gave, because of the things that he said. And they saw that the, the religion and the sunnah and the tawheed was spreading through him. Rahimahullah. So they would debate him. When they wouldn't win the debate, they would, it would cause them even more frustration and more anger. They would say, who can crush this man? They wouldn't find a way to resilience him. Rahimahullah. So what they did was, they plotted against him to get him behind bars. To put him what? Behind bars. Ibn Taymiyyah, whenever they would debate him, majority of the times was issues related to Aqidah. So he would take, he would put under his armpits the letters of Al Aqidah al Wasatiyah. He would carry it with him. And he would go to places. And he would say, This is my Aqidah. Just read it. And let's debate on that. Because the Shaykh, look at this, so sad. The Shaykh, they weren't able to debate him. They weren't able to argue with him. So what they did was they lied about him. They, they used to make up books and tribute to him. Imagine that level of animosity. They would write something and they would say this is what he wrote. And that would be taken to the courts and then he would be held account to it. And he, a lot of the times he would look. If you look at the beginning of his kitab, At-Tis'iniyah, he mentions that. He says, I never wrote this. Who wrote this? Wallahi ana ma katabtu. I've never written this. I've never said these words. They've never come out from me. And he, said, and he used to say, if I believed something, I would never lie about it. I would say I believe it. So he got arrested, rahimahullah. And when he got put behind bars, of course the days change. Not every day is your day. So what happened was, the ruler of these time changed. When a ruler takes out another ruler, he hates the previous ruler and anybody who's with him, right? So the people that were with the previous rulers become what? The most wanted. And the people who were against, the, the, the previous system was against, become what? Heroes. So, so Ibn Taymiyyah got taken out of prison. The ruler brought him out. They said that the ruler actually went down to Ibn Taymiyyah's prison and brought him out. He said, come out. You're not going to stay here. He said, what do you want me to do with the guys who put you behind bars? What do you think I should do? How should I deal with them? From them is a man by the name of Ibn Makhlouf al-Maliki. Ibn Makhlouf al-Maliki said, 
اقتل ابن تيمية ودمه على عنقي كل ابن تيمية and his blood I will tell I will speak for you guys the day of judgment he gave that fatwa يعني ابن تيمية's blood حلا وحرما where if he's found in the Kaaba or outside the Kaaba kill him he said so when he came out the fatwa was still there but the fatwa got taken down by who? by the new ruler so the ruler wanted ابن تيمية to give him fatwa and he wanted to destroy them all. Ibn Taymiyyah realized. He realized that what he says is going to give this ruler justification to kill other Muslims. Sah? So he, rahimahullah, when he, when, he, when, he, when, he, when he was asked about this issue, he said, no. Not at all. I do not allow that for any Muslim to be killed because of me. I do not permit that. I have forgiven, I have forgiven all of them. Are we all together? So that was the type of person, he was rahimahullah ta'ala, forgiving and turning a blind eye, he was known for that. It's not a matter, يعني, يعني, there's many mawaqif, I won't go through all of them, but the Shaykh rahimahullah was like that. One of the statements he said is فَلَا أُحِبُّ أَنْ يُنْتَصَرَ مِنْ أَحَدٍ بِسَبَبِ كَذْبِهِ أَوْ ظُلْمِهِ وَعُدْوَانِهِ فِي فَإِنِّي قَدْ أَحَلَلْتُ كُلُّ مُسْلِمٍ I don't want any Muslim to be harmed. I don't want any Muslim to be hurt because of something that they've said or done to me. I have forgiven every Muslim who has spoken about me, who have hurt me, who have caused me problems. I've forgiven every one of them. But what is connected to the rights of Allah? Then that's not in my hands, he said. If it's rights of Allah that you're going against, that's between you and Allah to repent to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sixth, the sixth characteristics of the Shaykh rahimahullah was he was very patient as a person. And he had a big heart. He had a very big heart. Never did it show in him that he was going through hard times. Not, not at all. He used to say, "Inna fi dunya jannah, man lam yadkhulha lam yadkhul jannat al akhirah." It was one of his quotes. He used to say, "This dunya has a jannah, and the jannah of this dunya, if you don't enter it, you're not going to enter the jannah of the hereafter." What he's referring to is the happiness of iman, the joy of iman is a jannah in this world. Akhirah, you are, he was a happy person. In one other place, Ibn al Qayyim said. Ibn Taymiyyah one day said to me, ما يصنع عدائي بي? What can my enemies possibly do to me? أنا جنتي وبستاني في صدري. My garden is in my chest. I have my garden in my chest. أين رحت فهي معي. Wherever I go, it goes with me. لا تفارقني. It doesn't leave me. My happiness and my joy is in my chest. In Habasani, if they imprison me now, it's a khalwa, it's a no itikaf for me. I'm just going to do adkaran. A time to focus on my ibadah and worship Allah. Wa qatri, if they kill me now, it's a shahada. Inshallah, martyrdom. Wa ikhraji min baladi, if they take me and excel me and take me out of my land now, it's a siyaha, meaning it's like a holiday for me. My enemies can't possibly, there is nothing that they can possibly do to me. I'm in a state of joy and happiness. And this is the most important things, brothers, we have to understand and comprehend. What is that we need to understand? That if the tide, you know a boat when it's on the sea, the water can be around the boat. As long as that water doesn't go on top of the boat, as long as it doesn't go on top of the boat, the boat won't sink. Sah? He didn't let what was happening around him get into his heart. He focused. Rahimahullah. That's why Allah wa ta'ala raised him. And a title that many people didn't get. He was given rahimahullah ta'ala. It was called Shaykhul Islam. Rahimahullah wa rahmatan wasi'a. Ibn al-Qayyim is one of the students of who? Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn al-Qayyim is one of the students of Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn al-Qayyim said one day about his teacher... I sometimes used to feel sadness. Which books do we read when we were 
يعني, to remove distress and sadness. What kind of books do we read? Ibn al-Qayyim's works, sah? Ibn al-Qayyim's works is focused on the heart and how to remove anxiety and distress and sadness, sah? Ibn al-Qayyim is saying, whenever I felt down, I would go to Shaykh al-Sam Taymiyyah. He will say to me words that would move, that touch our hearts and it will give us back that determination and focus. So that's the type of person he was, rahimahullah, rahimahullah wa rahmatan wasi'a. The eighth, inshallah ta'ala, point about his characteristics is he was a very brave person. Bravery and courage was a high quality, a high characteristics of his, rahimahullah. He didn't look at the person, but he looked at the truth and he said it as it was, rahimahullah. One of the statements he said was, he said, A man or a woman never fears a person. Min ghaydillah, other than Allah. There is not a person who fears someone other than Allah. Illa li maradin fi qalbi. He would only do that because there's a sickness in his heart. You would only be scared of someone other than Allah if you have sickness in your heart. So his tawakkul in Allah was very high, Shaykh Al-Islam Taymiyyah. And at his time, he proved how his tawakkul is. He used to say, وَلَيْسَ لِي مَا أَخَافُ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهِ There is nothing I fear the people of. He said, I don't fear لَا مَدْرَسَ وَلَا إِقْطَاعْ وَلَا مَالٍ وَلَا رِئَاسَ وَلَا شَيْءٍ مِنَ الْأَشْيَاءِ There is not a matter that I'm scared of on this world. He was by himself a government, rahimahullah ta'ala. He was a walking government. That was the type of person he was. When the Tatar came and Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah, the jihad was happening, he prepared himself, he put his armor on, they, they put their armor on, he said to them, inshallah ta'ala, today we're going to win. They said, say Shaykh, Shaykh, Shaykh al-Islam, say inshallah. He said, inshallah tahqiqan la ta'liqan. What does that mean? You know, Muslims just say, inshallah. No, no, no. He said, this inshallah, we're going to win. Is that inshallah? He had thiqa. In the middle of the battle, before it started, he said to the people, where do you think is the hardest to go into? And in the army right now, in front of us. Where do you think it's the hardest place for somebody to enter? They said to him, over there. He went right directly that direction. He went exactly that direction, rahimahullah ta'ala, and he fought the army from there. He took the Tatar and brought them to their knees. Rahimahullah. After that day, his opponents and those who were against him could not harm him anymore. And he was a hero. He was now a hero. And we all know, right, when, a, when, an, uh, when the soldiers bring victory home, what are they considered? Medals and things are given to him. Even recently, Surya, Surya, right? If, before Surya collapsed, Bashar Asad, يعني, his father, Bashar's father, built Ibn Taymiyyah's grave. The grave of Ibn Taymiyyah was built. Are we all together? Why was he built? This is a Nusayri. Why is he building Ibn Taymiyyah's grave? He was seen as a what? The hero of the country. Are we all together? He's looking at it from what perspective? As one of the batal min al abtal, one of the heroes of the country who like protected his country. Are we all together, brothers? So he was a hero, rahimahullah ta'ala, in terms of his uh, bravery. Rahimahullah rahmatan wasi'a. Tawadu'u, the ninth characteristics of the Shaykh rahimahullah is humility. He was a very humble individual. Shaykh al Islam was an extremely humble person. Tawadu'u was apparent on him. Very humble. He never saw himself to be something or something great. Al-Hafid Abu Hafs al-Bazar, he said, Wallahi ma ra'itu. He said, by Allah, I never saw anyone like him in tawadu, humility. And I never heard of anyone like that. He said, Ibn al-Qayyim, I saw Ibn Taymiyyah so many times scuffle on the earth. Yani, like scuffle on the earth. And say, Ya Mu'allima Dawood, alimni wa ya Mufahimu Sulaiman, fahimni. 
Whenever a mas'ala, a matter would be hard on him, he would humble himself and he would say, Ya Mu'allima Dawood, alimni. Wa Ya Mufahima Sulaymanu, fahimni. And then he said that the mas'ala, the issue would open up for me. And he would go and he would speak about it. He said about himself, Wallahi, inni al-ana ujaddidu islami. Every time I renew my Islam. Kulla waqt. Every opportunity. Wa ma aslamtu ba'da islam, islam and jayidan. I have not embraced a proper Islam yet. That's what he said. And one of his poetry that he wrote, Rahimahullah, with his own hand, is Ana al faqiru ila rabbi al bariyat. What did he say? Ana? Ana al faqiru. I am faqir in need. I am miskin. I'm. He said, Ana al faqiru ila rabbi al bariyat. Ana al miskinu fi majmu'i halati. In all of my situations, I'm what? In all of my situations, I'm what? He said, in all my situations, I'm a miskin. Rahimahullah. Those are the nine qualities that I mentioned of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah as a person. Who can remember what were the nine? Uh, yeah, who can re- repeat the nine characteristics we mentioned of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah? Hey, number one. His vast knowledge. What was number Hey, for number one, Ibn Taymiyyah's knowledge, was it vast? Yes. Okay. Who acknowledged Ibn Taymiyyah's knowledge? Those who were with him and those who were? Against, against him. Can anyone mention someone who was against him that said he was a scholar? Kamaluddin what? Kamaluddin. Well, Kamaluddin what? Ibn Zamalkani. Ibn Zamalkani, rahimahullah. Sah. He admitted it. Hey, what else did we mention from his... Uh, we mentioned here. Si'at ilmihi, hey, what was the second we mentioned? Hey? Uh, si'at hifdhihi is last. We mentioned his gujameel, barakallahu feek. We mentioned quwa to hifdhihi, his memorization was strong. Rahimahullah. What was the book that we mentioned? He memorized it before even reaching the age of 10. Hey? Yeah? Rawdatul Nadir wa Jannatul Munadir. Sahih. Written by who? Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi. By the way, Ibn Qudama took that book from Abi Hamid al-Ghazali's Kitab al-Mustasfa. Ibn Qudama read the Kitab al-Mustasfa of Abi Hamid al-Ghazali. He took out all of the issues he didn't agree with. And he's, uh, yeah, and he's a Hanbali and this is a Shafi'i. So he took out all the things he disagreed with and all the things that he didn't want. And he separated it and he wrote this Kitab. So it's a very advanced book. Are we all together, brothers? He read that book. Not only read it, he understood it, internalized it, rahimahullah, and memorized it. What else did I mention from the third characteristic? Hey? In order, in order, in order. Hey? Before that, I mentioned something before. He's... Yeah? Jameel. Jaladuhu fil ilmi wa ta'alim. Jaladuhu, yaanihi da shaykh, had jalad, meaning he had high level of inter- endurance and tolerance. When it came to knowledge and teaching. What was, the, what was the one I mentioned after that? His preci- precision in knowledge. <coughs> yani there's a lot of people who know, but they can't really... If you get into a discussion with them, they're, like, they're, they're confused. They don't know how to grab the issue. and They, and they, don't, have to, they, don't, they don't know how to grapple with the answer. Like, and he was not like that. The, 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 the statements and the quotes and what he wanted to say, Ibn Taymiyyah... It was kind of ala taraf al lisani. It was on the tip of his tongue, right like that. Bidalika, brothers, a person can be a hafiz and not be able to bring evidences for you. Being hafiz, starting the Quran and finishing it, is one thing. And know every verse in the Quran and know it from memory, but not being able to extract an ayah like that when you need it. He was like that. Yani the ability he had. It's another science, brothers, to be able to, to extract an ayah that you need, Allah. After you finish your Qur'an, this is some, it, it's, it takes time to say, I need an ayah. That's what the ayah means. Sah? One time what happened to him, Shaykh Hussain Taymiyyah, was he was carrying uh, the Qur'an and he was in a debate. Or he was carrying some letters, some, some, some notes. In there, of course, there was ayat and hadith in there. So he got angry, rahimahullah, and he threw it. And his opponents, 
They couldn't beat him in the debate. So what did they say? Allah, he threw the Quran and the hadith on the floor. That's what they said. Shaykh al Taymiyyah responded quickly. Do you know what he said? That's just, he was fast in his response. Musa. Ah, yeah. What did he say? Musa. What did Musa do? When he came back from the tour scene. Musa, when he came back from Torah Sayyidina, what happened? He threw the dog. He threw the dog. He threw the dog. He threw what was written on it. The Torah was written on it, right? The Torah, who wrote the Torah? The Ahadith of Sahih has shown Allah wrote the Torah biyadihi. That's the Hadith, right? Are we all together, brothers? Allah wrote the Torah with his hand. Ibn Taymiyyah said, <laughs> Musa, when he got angry, what did he do? He threw the, to- uh, the, 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 the wood, right? Yani that was the type of person he was. Yani suratul istidraq al-masail, yani getting every, anything he needed. He was sharp like that, rahimahullah. Yani he was a shakhsun yaqid, awake, alert, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala. What else did we mention from him? He was an aesthetic individual, zahid. He didn't care how he looked and his appearance and things like that. You know, what people take care of and... He wasn't like that. And also, in his, and we mentioned in there, generosity. He was very generous. At his time, there was a great scholar by the name of Abu Hajjaj al-Mizzi. His name was what? Abu Hajjaj al-Mizzi. You all know that Abu Hajjaj al-Mizzi, right? Yeah? Abu Hajjaj al-Mizzi. Abu Hajjaj al-Mizzi wrote the 35 volume books. 35 volume book on... Uh, the six uh, books of hadith, Bukhari, Muslim, Abi Dawood, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, and Nasa'i, all the six books of hadith, the narrators in there, and all their other works. Are we all together? Like Imam Bukhari, all of his works. And Imam Muslim, all of his works that he's written. The narrators are in there. Abu Hajjaj took those narrators, he wrote in a book, Kutahdeeb al Kaman. Are we all together? It's Muhakkak Matbu'ah. Sheikh Bashar Awad Ma'roof did the tahqiq of the kitab, 35 volumes. Abu al-Hajjaj al-Mizi was a scholar, bari, the great scholars of his time. And him and Ibn Taymi were very close friends, very close. At the time of Sheikh al-Islam Taymiyyah, Abu al-Hajjaj al-Mizi got put in prison. He got put in prison. Because he sat down and he taught the kitab, Khalq Af'ad al-Ibad, by Imam al-Bukhari. Abu al-Hajjaj sat down to teach Khalq of Ali al-Ibad. Are we all together? When he went into prison, when he went into prison, what happened? Ibn Taymiyyah at that time was the one time where the ruler was on the best side of Ibn Taymiyyah. He, it was the ruler I was telling you. He was happy with Ibn Taymiyyah. He had nothing against him. So the, Ibn Taymiyyah went and said, are we, living in a, are we living in a time where a scholar like that is going to be arrested? So the ruler said, please take him out. You're free to take him out. So he went down and he took the keys himself, Ibn Taymiyyah. He unlocked the, the doors and he brought Abu al-Hajjaj al mizi out. And he said, sit down and teach. That was the type of person he was. But when it came to him and his imprisonment, he didn't let anyone interfere with him. and He didn't let anyone help him and didn't care. But you know, his prison, Ibn Taymiyyah's imprisonment that he was in is not the, is not the kind of prison we know today. It was a prison where he had books, students can visit him, he just wasn't allowed to leave. Are we all together? Yeah, and he, there's a lot of kutub he wrote in prison. How did he write those books? Like in the last, the last time he was imprisoned, they stopped him from everything. No visitation, no one could come to him. They took the paper and pen from him. He was banned, banned. Yeah, and he, that's when he finished the Quran uh, 83 or 84 times. And he died reciting... The ayah, إِنَّ الْمُتَّقِينَ فِي جَنَّاتِ وَنَهَرْ فِي مَقْعَدِ صِدْقٍ عِنْدَ مَلِيكٍ مُقْتَدِرٍ He died there. And he cried and he said, if I was to, uh, if I knew what I know today, I would have spent my life on the Qur'an. If I knew, I would spend my life on the, on the Qur'an. So what you understand from this man's life, brothers and sisters, is that he wasn't just a shaykh in history after the salaf if I ever would if Allah would give me the chance 
after the Salaf, of course. And I could meet one person, it would be him. And I would love to meet him. Rahimahullah ta'ala. The love I have for Shaykh Islam Taymiyyah. Every time I read some of his works, I'm like, this is not normal. Yani, he's got Majmu'ul Fatawa, which is 30 something volumes, right? Bro, brothers and sisters, he wrote this from memory. A fatwa would come, he would write something. A question would come, he would write something. A man came and wrote a poetry rejecting the qadr of Allah, ta'ala, rejecting the qadr. So Shaykh Hussain Taymiyyah, they brought the poetry to him, he read it, he looked at it, he put it down, he turned towards the qibla, asked for a pen and paper, and he wrote. It's called Al-Qasidah to Ta'iyyah. On what? In Qadr. The explanation is about 500 pages, تقريبا, on what he said. Are we all together, brothers? He was made. Some of the scholars, they said, the way Allah mentioned in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا دَاوُدَ مِنَّا فَضْلًا يَا جِبَالُ أَوِّ بِي مَعَهُ وَالطَّيْرَ وَأَلَنَّا لَهُ الْحَدِيدِ The way Allah mentioned that He made the metal soft for Dawood alayhi salam. Allah made knowledge soft for Shaykh al The way he, he got the evidences and the knowledge, it was extremely soft for him, rahimahullah. Rahimahullah, rahmatan wasi'ah. Ibn Taymiyyah died. The fitna that started after his death was far greater then even his life, the fitna he went through. The trials and tribulations he went through in his life was nothing in comparison to what happened after that. His works were banned. It was illegal for you to have the works of Ibn Taymiyyah. If you were ever seen with the works of Ibn Taymiyyah, you will be behind bars. Are we all together? It was, it was extreme ban. Are we all together, brothers? So what he did was, he died, he left behind so much. He, he left what? Till today, till today, some of his books that haven't been written have been published. That he's written, sorry, that haven't been published, have been published now. And one of the great scholars of our time, who really mastered the works of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, and I was, honored to, I was honored to meet him. And I'm sure some of you have, already, some of you have met him or spoken to him was Sheikh Muhammad Uzair Shams. Sheikh Muhammad Uzair Shams, who knows him? Put your hand up. He was a prolific Sheikh of what? The works of who? Master, master. If you look at the works of Majmu' the, 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 the Jam'u al-Masail, Sheikh Muhammad Uzair Shams mastered that. Even recently before he died, he just brought out a... Uh, a work, a piece of work of Shaykh Hussain Taymiyyah that nobody else had ever, actually ever seen before. Because his works were illegal, it was hidden. It was hidden. And the reading Ibn Taymiyyah's handwriting is also even harder. So finding his works are hard. And Muhammad, Sheikh Muhammad Uzir Shams, I even asked him, I said, Sheikh, he goes, I, one page, he said, it takes time for me. It's hard for anybody to read. The works of Ibn Taymiyyah. I'm going to quickly go over the history of the works of Ibn Taymiyyah, how they were brought out. Until we come to Sheikh Muhammad Uzair Shams, rahimahullah, rahmatan wasi'ah. As soon as he died, there was a scholar by the name of, his name is known as uh, Sheikh Ibn Hizamin, Imaduddin al Wasiti. He wrote a letter to the students of Ibn Taymiyyah. Imaddin al Wasiti, he has a kitab called Tadkirat wal Atibar. I encourage you all to read that book. This man, uh, Ibn Hizamin, he reached the highest level of tasawwuf. Are we all together back in the, before we met Ibn Taymiyyah? He was a Sufi, and of course, you know the Sufis, they go for, through levels. Who knows what levels they go through? They got names, titles, like you know, like you get... yeah, huh? 
هيا هنا يا يا ابدال هي زوان هي اقطاب هي اما الدين الوسط يريد ان الهايث ليفل يوز ذا ون اوف ذا اقطاب هي ما ابن تيميا ابن تيميا هي سر هي هاو as you know ابن تيميا he had a debate with a group known as الرافعيس who believed they used to lie to the people they used to pretend to be يعني they used to pretend that they were يعني اولياء of الله تبارك وتعالى so what they used to do was they used to say that the fire can't burn us so they, they would go through the fire and they would walk through the fire and then people see that Allahu Akbar and of course people follow that stuff they like that they believe it oh Allah you will even awliya they will prostrate to him so they so Ibn Taymiyyah had a debate with them and the man he got excited and he threw himself into the fire and he said look and this is what you know gets the people and he thought that was going to work with Ibn Taymiyyah Ibn Taymiyyah said come here come here said, stand here he asked for vinegar to be brought they used to put this stuff on he said bring vinegar Put that vinegar on. Wipe it over yourself. Both of us are going to put the hand, our hands into the fire. Let's see. This man knows. If he puts the vinegar on, the dune and everything that was on his hand is going to go. So he goes, no. Yani, the shaykh was like that. Hatta in any angle they tried to debate with him, he would always beat them. So what he did was, from there, he took a lot of their t- people from the Sufi away from them. And from the people he did was this great Imam. That's why I say brothers. Imaduddin al Wasati, Shaykh ibn Hizamin, they call him. He, you have to read his works. Because he went through Tasawwuf, when he learned the Sunnah and Tawheed and Aqidah properly with Shaykh al Islam Taymiyyah, he combined, he combined between the heart softening according to the Kitab and the Sunnah. That's why his works are very good for the heart. As you know, Ibn al-Qayyim was the same, right? Ibn al-Qayyim, before he met Ibn Taymiyyah, was on Tasawwuf. Hey, naam. Ibn al-Qayyim was on, upon Tasawwuf. Who took him out of it? And he mentions it in his kitab. He mentions in his kitab, Al-Kafiyah to Shafi'ah. And Ibn al-Qayyim, advising the people. Yani, wallahi, brothers, I'm a sincere advisor to you. No, Qasida to Mimiya, not his Kafiyah to Shafiyah. Fil intisar lil firqati najiya. He has a Qasida called Qasida to Mimiya, Ibn Qayyim. In the Hikim, it's sad poetry, he says, like people, I'm, I'm speaking to you from my heart. I'm going to tell you about a scholar who changed my life and will change all of your lives. A scholar from Harran. And he then describes Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim. Before this, I was mentioning something. Yeah, so when he died, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Ibn Hizamiyin, I'm a Shaykh, Ibn Huza, uh, Shaykh Al-Huzamiyin, he wrote a letter to the students of Ibn Taymiyyah. Are we all together, brothers? I'm going to speak about this after the break, inshallah Ta'ala. You guys have five minutes break. No, no. How long is the break for? Ten minutes, inshallah Ta'ala. And after ten minutes, we're going to resume, inshallah Ta'ala.
Question, inshallah. After, yes, after one. Yes. What time is it meant to finish? Okay. But normally, what time, would, was, what time did it say that it was finished? 9.30. It was finished 9.30. So we have 35 minutes. Yeah, 35 minutes. جزاك الله خيرا بارك الله فيك عمر ها عبد الغني ما شاء الله The scholars who praised Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and spoke about him and praised him, they are many. The numbers are over 500, all of whom are scholars of all different madhabs. One of the statements I'm going to mention is the statement of Al-Allama al-Safadi. Safadi, the reason I chose to mention him is because Safadi was from the students of Subki. And Subki was what? Taqiyuddin al-Subki was what? Against Ibn Taymiyyah. Taqiyuddin al-Subki was against Ibn Taymiyyah. Him and Ibn Taymiyyah had issues. And Alama al Safadi said about Ibn Taymiyyah when he described him, وَكَانَ إِذَا تَكَلَّمَ Ibn Taymiyyah was a person, if he spoke, أَغْمَضَ عَيْنَيْهِ He would close his eyes. His eyes would be closed whilst he's speaking. وَازْدَحَمَتِ الْعِبَارَةِ عَلَى لِسَانِهِ And the information would run, rush to his mouth. فَرَأَيْتُ الْعَجَبَ الْعَجِيبِ He said, I saw fascination and wonder in this man. He would close his eyes. That's how he used to do tafsir. The Shaykh, rahimahullah, he would close his eyes. Every ayah he would mention, he would reference the imams that preceded him in the understanding. One time he said, one ayah, I can give reference to a hundred different sources. A hundred different sources. Just on one ayah. 
يعني you would يعني simply understand him as a Google search the information that this man had رحمه الله رحمة واسعة when he died and passed away what happened was his works were buried a lot of them were buried and a lot of it was burnt sadly enough it was destroyed so Ibn Shaykh al-Hizamin Ahmaduddin al-Wasiti he wrote a letter talking to the uh, students of Ibn Taymiyyah he mentions this in his kitab Al-Tadkirah wal Atibar. and he mentions in that how now that Ibn Taymiyyah has died the students of the, sh- of the Shaykh should come together and you all know who his students they were Imagine having these people as your students. His students were Abu Abdullahi, Ibn Rushayq. Some of you don't know him. He was the master of the works of Ibn Taymi. He, he was the only one who had the best ability to read it. Another person who was very good at reading Ibn Taymi's works were, and very familiar with it, was Ibn Al Qayyim Al Jawziyah, rahimahullah. Also, from the people that benefited from Ibn Taymiyyah and took from him is Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah. Ibn Kathir is from the students of who? Ibn Taymiyyah. And from the students also of Ibn Taymiyyah was Al Imam Al Dhahabi. Al Imam Al Dhahabi. Abu Hafs Al Barzali, I mentioned. Al Bazar, sorry. Abu Hafs Al Bazar was one of his students. Alamuddin al-Barzali was also from the students of Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah. All of these people are today considered the giants of Islamic history. He was a university who produced the biggest giants we know of. Ibn Kathir is the one who wrote Al-Bidayah wa Nihayah. You know why we call it Bidayah wa Nihayah? He started from the first creation Allah created. And he took it to until the last person goes to Jannah. And the last person goes to the Hawfaya. So. Ibn Kathir is a Mufassir. His Tafsir, we, we all know it, right? Tafsir Ibn Kathir. He has a kitab called Ikhtisar Ulum Al Hadith, in Mustalah Al Hadith. He's a Faqih Imam. But what madhab was he from? He was a Shafi'i. Ibn Taymi's students wasn't Hanbali, like Shaf- they were all madhabs. Dhahabi is madhab, what's your madhab? Shafi'i. And Imam Dhahabi is a what? Shafi'i. Fuqaha al Hanaf, from them, from the great scholars of the Hanafi madhab is Ibn Abi al-Izz al-Hanafi who explained the Sharh Aqid Tahawiyah and to understand the weight of the works of Ibn Taymiyyah the Kitab al-Aqid Tahawiyah the Sharh is written by who? Is Ibn Abi al-Izz al-Hanafi, right? Ibn Abi al-Izz al-Hanafi his whole entire book is referenced from Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn al-Qayyim that's what the whole book are we all together brothers? The whole kitab, Sharh Ibn Abi Al-Izz Al-Hanafi on Sharh Al-Qid Tahawiyah is what? Ibn Taymiyyah and who? Ibn Al-Qayyim. But was he able to reference Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Al-Qayyim? Why did he not mention it was their works? Is that plagiarism? No. He didn't do it because he would be imprisoned if he did. You can't mention these men. Are we all together? It's illegal. So he just had to take their quotes and not reference them. So, Ibn, Abu Abdullah ibn Rushayq, Ibn Al-Qayyim, they tried to save as much as they could from the works of Ibn Taymiyyah. They protected as much as they could. They copied a lot of that which they could. Students were given to take it, write it, keep it. Don't, and hide it. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He brought out giants after that. Who came out to works on the to work on the works of Shaykh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, 
and bring it out into the light. From them is Jabaluddin uh, uh, Al-Qasimi from Sham, Muhammad Rashid Rida from Egypt, um, Muhammad Rashad Salim. By the way, Muhammad Rashad Salim, he did haqiqat of many of the works of Shaykh Hussain Taymiyyah. And he used to be, he graduated from, uh, it was either Oxford or Cambridge University. He was an Egyptian sheikh. He served the works of Ibn Taymiyyah. Also from the people who worked on the works of Shaykh Hussain Taymiyyah is Shaykh Hussain Muhammad Abdul Hab. And the entire madrasa of Muhammad Abdul Hab, they took on the works of who? Shaykh Hussain Taymiyyah. From Iraq, Muhammad Shukri Al Alusi, Rahimahullah. He worked on the, the works of Shaykh Hussain Taymiyyah, Rahimahullah. Shaykh Muhammad Nasiruddin Al Albani, Rahimahullah. Shaykh Abdul Aziz Al Mubaz, Shaykh Al Uthaymeen, and all of these great scholars, they endorsed the works until our organization that was run by Al Alama Bakr ibn Abdullah Abu Zayd. Sheikh Bakr Abu Zayd started the biggest movement to revive the works of Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. And he worked towards it. And it started with him. And of course he died and it wasn't finished. It was working on the works of a few great imams. From them was uh, Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn al-Qayyim and Muhammad al-Amin al-Shamqiti and Abd al-Rahman Yahya al-Mu'allimi. And they all got published by a publication called Dar al-Alim al-Fawaid. Dar al-Alim al-Fawaid took on it with the Isharaf of Sheikh Bakr Abu Zayd. A few people were the muhaqqiqeen of the works. A few people were selected to work on the works. From them is Sheikh Ali al-Imran, Sheikh Muhammad al-Uzir Shams was one of the members. Abdurrahman Qa- Hassan Qa'id, uh, Muhammad Jam- Jamil uh, uh, Al-Islahi, I think. Um, a few of them stood up to work on the Mu'allafat of Sheikh. The biggest of them, of course, who had the biggest hand in it, who did the haqiq of the majority of the books, was Sheikh Muhammad Uzir Shams. Sheikh Muhammad Uzir Shams single-handedly really done one of the biggest works. He's a scholar from India, Rahimahullah. And um, he spent a good portion of his life on the works of Shaykh al-Islam, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah. Daqiq, books that no one thought that even Ibn Taymiyyah wrote were, were brought out to the world and people saw it for the first time. Like we've not, we didn't even know this book existed. Dar al-Alm Fawaid published it. Dar al-Alm Fawaid was financially supported by uh, the owner of Bank al-Rajihi, al-Rajihi Bank, Sheikh Salih, Sheikh, uh, Salih al-Rajihi. He was the one who used to do tamwil of the project. But then the project got removed uh, from his wealth and uh, the Dar al-Alm Fawaid ended. Dar al-Alm Fawaid ended. So what happened was two big publication companies came together called Dar ibn Hazm and Ata'atul Ilm. They came together, combined efforts, and they again republished some of the works. Because the books, they finish, right? When the people take it, they finish. They need, they need people to keep, give it life, keep, keep going. Or if a hundred years goes, goes by, the books are not found. And the people who own it are not giving it out. So there has to be a pumping machine that pumps, pumps the books all the time. So Ata'atul Ilm and Dar Hazm seem to be publishing it. Every now and then it finishes from the market. But Alhamdulillah, I heard that they're going to bring it all out again. From the first of them to the last they're going to bring. That being said, Shaykh Hussain Taymiyyah, no one can really tell you what he's written. His books are too many. There are thousands and thousands of works. He never consulted people when he wrote. So he would write quickly and that would be taken by another person. As you know, his works, they were restricted. Uh, I, I mean, his works 
were from particular lands, people would ask him questions. Someone would come from Wasit, and they would ask him a question, and it would be called Aqidatul Wasitiyya, Aqidatul Hamawiyya, from Hama, Aqidatul Tadmuriyya, from Tadmur, Aqidatul Madaniyya, from Medina. People would ask him questions, and he would answer those questions, and it would be named after the city. That person might take it for themselves. Are we all together? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the thing is, you all have to understand is, who thought that his works would become like this? Well, I, you rarely find a book. Whether they like him or not, he's quoted in there. He's inside that book. Somewhere, where, somewhere. Whether it be non-Muslim or Muslim, it doesn't matter. Are we all together? And one of the best, one of the best, actually, to be honest, biographies that were done on, on Ibn Taymiyyah's life in the English language, is done by a non-Muslim. His name is called John Hoover. There's two places I feel like he did a mistake on, but the rest of the book, John Hoover was just and fair in the way he wrote Ibn Taymiyyah's life. He's a non-Muslim. Ibn Taymiyyah caught the attention of the Orientalists, the Christian missionaries, the Jews, everyone. He studied in universities. His PhDs, dissertations. An Orientalist I met in my days in London when I used to go to the British Library. A guy I met there. He said to me, in history, no one has ever written a work as powerful as Ibn Taymiyyah on the issue of Al-Aql and Naql. How to reconcile between logic and text. And he said to me, Wallahi, this is the words that this man said to me. He said to me, Abdul Rahman, the world today is just fighting over that. The concept Ibn Taymiyyah was talking about then is what the arguments today are. Separate the government <coughs> from religion, right? All of this isms that you're hearing. Everything humans are coming with. Science is what? What is science based on? It's based on, right now, the scientists, the, the or atheists, what are they pushing right now? Science can explain everything. Leave science... For let, let science say things to us. Don't bring religion into science. Sah? Are we all together? Yes. Funny enough, that statement itself is an unscientific statement. Sah? To say science can explain everything is an unscientific statement. Sah? Because what's, what's science based on? Empirical evidence, right? Can they empirically prove that science can explain everything? The point I'm trying to say to you is Wallahi, Billahi, Tallahi Qasam al man ahalla al I swear by Allah Anyone who reads Kitabu Dar'u ta'arud al-aql Ibn Taymi rahimahullah Dar'u ta'arud al-aql wa al-naql Wastu'abaha swallows it I mean, read it with understanding of what he's saying You will not find anything on this earth today that people are pushing except he's answered it there I swear by Allah and I will stand in front of you on al qiyamah that book, all of the misguidances that the people are coming with today, from whether they be amongst Islam and the Muslims, or whether it be the non-Muslims, whatever it may be, I have, you will not find except an, a, a response to it by Ibn Taymiyyah in that kitab. And it's considered to be one of his masters, masterpiece. Are we all together? Dar'u ta'arud al-aqli wa naql it's, it's, it's called It's called Dar'u It's to repel He called it Dar'u Ta'arud Al-Aqli Wa Naql It's about 17 volumes It's about 17 volumes What does he talk about there? Only one thing Only one point he's focusing on This Logic And revelation He says something very powerful. He says, 
rahimahullah ta'ala. The religion of Allah Azza wa Jalla does not bring to us in the revelation. Yani the revelation never comes with the impossible. We will never see something in the revelation where like, whoa, that's impossible. But the, evident, the revelation might bring what may confuse our minds, but not impossible. He divides it into mahalatul uqul and maharatul uqul. Now you all together. There might be something you, you might scratch your head and say, hmm. But it's not impossible. And that scratch that you're scratching your head and you're like, hmm, I don't understand this. It's subjective. It's to you maybe. Because there are external factors that are causing you to feel this way. Maybe the society and the environment and the people you've grown up with is why you're thinking like this. Does that make sense? He put down a, something يعني, phenomenal. He said, Rahimahullah, in that book, the text, the Quran and the Sunnah, and logic, if you think when you come to it, they go against each other, it's one of the following reasons. Either the text is weak, and somebody told you, of a weak narration. If you research the hadith, you're going to find it's a weak hadith. Or, you are mentally deficient. And it doesn't, it's not, it, this is not to everybody else, it's just to you. Are we all together? Does that make sense? That's the only two possibilities. But it's never possible a evidence which is sahihun, sarihun, he uses those two words, sahihun, authentic, and sarihun is direct, goes against the what? He challenged them for this. He bring it to me, one. I'm here to uh, show you the way to reconcile it. Are we all together, brothers? And the way he answered, because this book, by the way, he's uh, refuting Fakhruddin al-Razi. Fakhruddin al-Razi is one of the head of the Asha'ira, right? Fakhruddin al-Razi is the... What? If the Asha'ira say, qala al-imamu, they're referring to Fakhruddin al-Razi. So Shaykh al-Sam team is refuting him because Fakhruddin al-Razi claimed that if logic and the text go against each other, he said that there's the, the, there's the following ways that they should be reconciled between. What are they? He said we either take the logic, uh, so we either take the text. No, first he said, Fakhruddin Razi said, first of all, we, we, re, we, re, we accept both of them. And he said, la You can't take two opposites. Fakhruddin Razi is saying this. We have an ayah and a logic going against each other. He said, you either take both of them. And he said, that's not possible. You can't take two opposites. Does that make sense? And he said, we reject them both. That's also not possible. You're in a situation, you can only take one of two. Are we all together? So he said, that's the, those two options are, are gone. We only have two more options. He said, the third option is, you take the text. You take the what? You take the text and you reject the logic. And he said, that's not going to work. Why? Because if you take the text and you reject the logic, what brought you to the text was logic in the first place. So by taking the text, you've by in essence really rejected the text as well, he said. Did that make sense? Because it's logic that brought you to the text in the first place. So if you dismiss logic and you take the text, the text was sitting on logic. You pulled out logic, the text goes, it falls. There's no text anywhere for you. Okay? So the only option you have, which is the fourth, Fakhruddin Razi said, is you take the logic and you dismiss the text. And that's what the Asha'ira are upon. Ibn Taymiyyah came and said, this is qawl and azimah. And you know how he responded? He said, no. Who told you? He, he, by the way, to them, you have to be logical in the response. He said, who told you? That if logic brought me to something, and then I, dis I suspend logic for a bit, and take text over it, 
that that means in essence that I have what? Rejected logic. I mean, rejected text. He said, I'll show you that that is a flawed argument. How? He said, let's say you wanted to go to a doctor. You had an illness and you wanted a doctor. And somebody said to you, I will take you to the doctor. I know there is a doctor who, who, who specialized in your illness. Come with me, I'll take you. <coughs> that person drove you. They took you to the doctor. And then you're now talking to the doctor. The person who brought you to the doctor says to you, don't listen to the doctor. And you're like, no, I don't want to listen to you. I need to speak to the doctor. Please, can you let me just talk to the doctor? <coughs> can I just please talk to the doctor? And, you, and the person says, why are you dismissing me for? I was the one who brought you to the doctor in the first place. Does that make sense? Yes. Ibn Taymiyyah, he said, you just rejected the person who brought you to the doctor because now that they brought you to the doctor... The doctor is going to tell you what your illness is and what medication you take. If logic brought you to the text, I can suspend it if I want to and just take what? The text. Huh? Does that make sense? Does that make sense what he said? That's just him refuting them in that regard. But he didn't believe that logic and text anyways goes against each other. Logic and text. Ibn Taymiyyah never believed it, got, it went against each other in the first place. He went against that whole premise and he proved that he doesn't. And the non-Muslim, subhanAllah, he, he dismantled them. One of the beautiful things that I like about Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah is that he doesn't, he doesn't just say no to something. Nor does he just say yes. I love this about him, rahimahullah. What do I mean by that? He is the type to say yes, and my reason is this. And he will explain his reason. Whether you agree with him or not, that's different. But he has the... The desire to explain, he allows the person to know where he's coming from. Are we all together? One of his most powerful statements is, he said, فَإِنِّي كُنْتُ دَائِمًا أَعْلَمُ أَنَّ عِلْمَ الْمَنْطِقِ لَا يَسْتَفِيدُ مِنْهُ لَا يَحْتَاجُ إِلَيْهِ الدَّكِي وَلَا يَسْتَفِيدُ مِنْهُ الْبَلِيدِ وَلَا يَنْتَفِعُ مِنْهُ الْبَلِيدِ فَإِنِّي كُنْتُ دَائِمًا أَعْلَمُ أَنَّ الْمَنْطِقَ الْيُنَانِ uh, he said, I always knew that Greek logic, the smart person does not need it. And the dim-witted one, the dullard person, okay, will not benefit from it. And he said, my reason is the following. And he wrote a whole kitab on it. Called Ar-Raddu Alal Mantiqiyin. I will tell the brothers. Where he proves, because... For logic is uh, the logic is built upon what? It's built upon two things. Mantiq is built on two things. The entire mantiq that you hear, I'm a, logic that you hear stands on two things. Perception and judgment. Perception. I'm a, what they also call conceptualization of something. To conceptualize something and to pass a judgment on it. You all heard the famous statement of the scholars, al hukmu ala shay'un far'un an tasawuri. Before you place a ruling on a matter, you have to have a perception of it. Does that make sense? So logic is define this thing and then pass a ruling on it. Ibn Taymiyyah went after them on the issue of a tasawwur. Perception and conceptualization. What does it mean to conceptualize something? And are the Greek logians, are they correct in their methodology? That's a long story. I don't want to bore you with that. But he was a hamilu liwa'i. A hamilu rayatihi. He was carrying the banner of even the sciences that Plato, yeah, and Socrates and Aristotle claimed. He, the Shaykh Rahimahullah Ta'ala, was, he was above and beyond them. Are we all together, brothers? One of the people who pushed the works of Aristotle and just were, were, were all over it is Ibn Sina. Ibn Sina. Farabi came before Ibn Sina. Farabi explained the works of Ibn Sina. And so and, uh, Ibn Sina came after Farabi and he benefited from Al-Farabi. Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala he dismissed, dismantled sorry, Ibn Sina's positions and even proved that he himself doesn't actually know what he is talking about. That kitab to learn Arabic for it is must. To study a lot of sciences is also a must. 
but a student of knowledge should take time out to study the works of Shaykh al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. I don't believe that today anyone can be without it. It's a must. You have to. It's a must. Ibn Taymiyyah's works is a must. I'm not saying blind follow everything he says, but it's a must. There's two men that occupied the world and today's ideologies, they stand on these two men. On the sh everyone who comes stands on the shoulder of these two men. One is Ibn Taymiyyah and the other one is who? Ibn Taymiyyah is under Ibn Al-Qayyim. The world today, the groups of people that are fighting today and all the disagreements and back and forth in the world that you see today stand on two big men's shoulders. Who are they? One is Ibn Taymiyyah and the other one is? Imam al-Shafi and Ahmed bin Hanbal, all Ibn Taymiyyah represents them. Hey? Yeah? Come on. Two men you have to know. Everybody who came after these two men, take from them. Either... You are either going to be this way, Ibn Taymiyyah, and we all know where you're, where you're going to end. Or you take this path and we know where you're going to end. It is Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. Those are the two men. You take Abu Hamid al-Ghazali's path, you become an Ash'ari, Sufi. You take this path, you're a Sunni Salafi. So these two men have to be studied. The impact that Ibn Taymiyyah had on the world, Abi Hamid al-Ghazali had that as well. With all honesty. And that's why you see Ibn Taymiyyah's refutations were very solid against who? Abi Hamid al-Ghazali. Does that make sense? But today, when you look at the Sunnis today, they're one of these two groups. Huh? The Asha'ira and the Sufis, Abi Hamid, Abi Hamid, Abi Hamid, Sah. The Salafis and Al Hadith, what did they say? Ibn Taymiyyah, صح? ولذلك Sheikh Muhammad Muhammad Rashad Salim, Sheikh Muhammad Rashad Salim, who's, who specialized in the works of Ibn Taymiyyah that I mentioned to you guys, he's written a book called What did he call it? You can find it online. It's uh, I don't remember the name of the book. Muhammad Rashad Salim. It's basically between Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Abi Hamid al-Ghazali. He writes, this is what Ibn Taymiyyah was, and this is what Abi Hamid al-Ghazali is. Yeah? Muhammad bin Ghazali was yesterday. Muhammad al-Ghazali was yesterday, meaning he was recent. Yesterday is a figurative speech, I don't mean yesterday. He's recent. We're talking about Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. You know Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, right? Yeah? Yeah? The author of the kitab, Hiya Ulum al Din, Hiya Ulum al Din, he has a kitab called Al Qistas al Mustaqim, he has a kitab called Al Munkidhu min al Dalala, he has another kitab called Tahafit al Falasifa, he has another kitab called Al Mustasfa, which he wrote in Ilm Usulit, he has a kitab called Al Wasit, Wal Wajiz, Wal Basit, Fi Fakhi Shafi'i. He's a Fakhi Shafi'i. Fakhi Shafi'i. What did the poet say? Haddab al Madhaba? Habrun, hey, what's the poetry? Be basitin, hey? Wa wasitin. Wa wajizin. Wa khulasa. Those are the four books in the, the Shafi'i Madhab. Are we all together? And he's a student of Abu Ali al-Jwaini, and Imam al-Haramain. You guys don't know Abu Ali al-Jwaini? Al-Waraqat? Yeah? The author of Al-Waraqat, Abu Ali al-Jwaini, his student is Muhammad Ghazali. So you have to study all this, by the way, brothers. If you don't know it, no problem. In life, there's always a starting point. There's a place you have to start from, right? So I will read these two madhabs, and so much came from it. لذلك أشاعرة أبي حامد الغزالي سلفيز أنه الحديث لذلك all the scholars I mentioned to you, every they all come from that madrasa of who? No, from Ibn Taymiyyah. I'm talking about the Muta'akhirin. I'm talking about those who came later. The Muta'akhirin I'm talking about. 
Albani, Ibn Baz, Ibn Uthaymin, all the ulama you see. They all, uh, the madrasa of Ibn Taymiyyah. Hatta Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, madrasa of Ibn Taymiyyah. Goes back to who? Ibn Taymiyyah. And also here, Abi Hamid al Ghazali. Are we all together, brothers? All the Muhammad Zahid al Kothari and. Yeah? And uh, Abdul Fatah Abu Ghudda. Yeah. What's his name? Mamduh. Uh, so for the Sufis, they're like from the Ottomans. Ottomans, oh, Abu Hamid al Ghazali. Ghazali is the 6th century Imam. 6th century. Yeah? Ibn Taymiyyah is not. Ibn Taymiyyah is the 8th century Imam. There's two year, 200 years between them. Ibn Taymiyyah was, was before the Ottoman Empire. Before. Of course, Ibn Taymiyyah was way before the Ottoman Empire. Under, under, under his guidance, I mean, under his guidance means what he wrote, what the grave must not be decorated. But he's not the one who said that, the Prophet said that. After. No, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ali said to Abu Hayyaj al-Asadi, Ala ab'athuka ala ma ba'athani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ali ibn Abi Talib said to Abu Hayyaj al-Asadi, shall I not send you with what the Prophet sent me with? What did he say to him? Qabran mushrifan illa sawaita. That you do not see a grave that's standing except you break it. You, sl- you s- flatten it. So that was something the Prophet told Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali told Abu Hayyaj al-Asadi, this is something the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam five days before he died. What did he say? La'ana Allahu al-Yahuda wa al-Nasara ittakhadhu qubura anbiya in masajid. May Allah's curse be upon the Christians and the Jews. They took the graves of their what? Their righteous people, their, pe- their people, they took it as masajids. Like, they took the, the concept of grave to us is a place to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to remember the day of judgment, to day, remember the day that we're going to all be here. But they took it as a place to worship. And in Islam, we don't, we don't worship these people in the graves, even though we know they're greater than us, the people in Baghir. These are noble sahabas, radiyallahu ta'ala anhum. Ay na'am. Allahumma amin. Now, since you gave us a great speech regarding Ibn Taymin as well, uh, where should a student's knowledge start his first book reading uh, Ibn Taymin's works? Ibn Taymin's life, many people wrote about it. There's many works written on it. The biggest one is Al-Uqud al-Durriya fi ba'di manaqib al-Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah by Ibn Abdul Hadi. It's the biggest. Everyone who comes, يعني, it's from there. He was a student of Ibn Taymiyyah. It's called Al-Uqud al-Durriya. That's the biggest book on the life of Ibn Taymiyyah. Al-Uqud al-Durriya. But there's other books that are written on his life. Abu Hafs al-Bazzar has a kitab called al It's called al uh, It's called... It's called Al-I'lam Al-Aliyya. He's written it. Abu Hafs Al-Bazzar. Um, also, Sheikh Bakr Abu Zayd. Remember when they started the project that I mentioned to you, that Al-Alam Fawaid. They wrote what is called Jam Al-Jami' Lithirati Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. They wrote Al-Jami' In there they mentioned a lot of the books that... Uh, uh, they mentioned a, a good comprehensive biography of the Sheikh. And I think for eight centuries, all the people, what they said about Ibn Taymiyyah is in there. So it's a very comprehensive book. If you haven't, if you can't read Arabic, then I think you should just write, get the book by John Hoover. John Hoover. John with not a H. It's just J-O-N. J-O-N. You can actually download it right now. and you, It's online. So you don't have to buy it. Uh, in Arab. What first book should I start from? The first book. As, as, as like introduction. Of his life or his works? No, his works. Ah, oh, Al-Wasitiyah. 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 Al-Wasitiyah is a must. That's a, like a, 
That's where it all starts from you. Where should open the door? Yeah. It opens That's the door for you. Once you finish al wasati you go for al hamawiya Once you go for al hamawiya you go for his Tadmuriya. Once you go for his Tadmuriya, you go for his uh, al asfahaniya Once you go for Sharh al asfahaniya then mashallah, Allah mabarik, you now know what he's talking about. You can go everywhere. All of these are from all of them are Ibn Taymiyyahs. There's a muhadara done by Sheikh, sorry. There's a muhadara done by Sheikh Salah Ali Sheikh. It's called Kayfa Aqra U Kutub Ibn Taymiyyah. Good muhadara. Beautiful. There's a PDF, which is mufarraq, and also a lecture, muhadara. You can listen to it. You'll benefit from it a lot. There was like a two, two points mistakes I wrote on it. I can't remember now. But inshallah ta'ala, I want to... Uh, uh, planning inshallah ta'ala to do a lengthy series on the life of Ibn Taymiyyah. Very lengthy. I'm going to do it when I go back to the U, U, UAE inshallah ta'ala. To talk about this man's life in great detail inshallah ta'ala. And after that I want to talk about every single works of his. I want to spend time explaining what this book is about. What he said in this book. Not teach the book. But really... I'm talking about over a hundred videos on just him, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, and his works, focusing on each one, taking his kitab al hamawiya okay, and explaining why he wrote this book, where he wrote this, what made him write it, what's the best publication for it, all of the things related to every single part after I finish his biography. Yeah? It's called Ibn Taymiyyah or something like that, Life and Legacy or something like that. Just write John Hoover. Hoover is J O N Hoover H O O V E R. Yeah, it's only one written one, one book of Ibn Taymiyyah. He, he's a he's a non-Muslim. He teaches in the University of Nottingham in the UK, and he's he's specialized in Ibn Taymiyyah. Yeah, and from the Orientalist, of course, specialized for us is like please, but like in. He specialized from the non-Muslims' perspective. He's, all he does is just reads the works of Ibn Taymiyyah. All he does is just reads Ibn Taymiyyah's works. The title is Ibn Taymiyyah, that's it. Yeah, Ibn Taymiyyah, yeah. That's, yeah, Ibn Taymiyyah. Yeah, Jan that's it. Uh, what was the conflict with the ruler for which he was banned? That's a good point. Ibn Taymiyyah wasn't a rebellious person, his, like from his biography, with all honesty. He wasn't anti-government. He wasn't telling the people to go against the government or things like that. It's just that he had views that did not sit well with the, constitu the constitution of his time. Of course, as you all know, Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, rahimahullah ta'ala, may Allah bestow his never-ending mercy on him. When he took over Egypt after the Crusades and he destroyed them and everything, what pushed amongst the Muslims was a belief called Ash'ari, Ash belief, uh, in Am. So it spread so much. It became the dominant view for a long time. From the time of Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, um, and Salahuddin being a, a righteous man, a great man, a man who's done a lot for Islam and the Muslims, uh, uh, Mahmoud Nuruddin uh, Zanki, rahimahullah, who was also the leader of the Dawlatul Ayyubiya. And him and Salahuddin were, re were related, right? So these two men were good men. But the Ash'ari belief was, was, was what they pushed onto the people. And once there was a fitna that happened called Fitnatul Qushayriya in Baghdad, where the Hanabila and the Sha'ira had a big fight. So this really pushed a Sha'ira to the most dominant idea. You, there, wasn't, there wasn't anyone you would find except there was Ash'ari at, at that period of time. So when he came, Ibn Taymiyyah, he came and everybody just was surrendered and no one was questioning what, what the Sha'ira believed. No one was bringing their stuff out and really showing the people. So he unearthed so much things. So he became a nuisance to the rulers and those around the rulers because, again, it's like the dominant idea is this. You're coming with <coughs> absurd things. What are you talking about? Where did you get that from? And so it was like... They, are you there? And people, when they are fixed on something, and somebody comes, some, brings them something new, they all like, no, he left the religion. That's what happened to Sheikh Islam Taymiyyah. So he was accused of her heresy. He was accused of apostating. And actually, I'll tell you something. 
One of the one of the times he got arrested was because of the issue of uh, the talaq of thalath. Sah? The three talaq. What did Ibn Taymi believe? If you do three talaq, it becomes what? He believed it was one. This goes against the call of the four imams. The most pro- not, the, 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 the prominent idea that every fatwa at that time was like three, three. three. And he, that mas'ala by itself caused him prison, imprisonment. And he was beaten and he was harmed, rahimahullah, because of it. Today, that's the only fatwa that's applied everywhere in the world, even Asar. Everywhere in the world, that's become the what? The official fatwa. Sah? That fatwa he gave, rahimahullah ta'ala, he got imprisoned for and beaten and all that. So it was idea of ideologies that he... The biggest issues that he had was the issue of Allah's names and attributes. Are we all together? Let me tell, explain something to you guys. Ibn Taymiyyah, a sha'ira is a, is a group that came out from a man by the name of Abul Hassan al-Ash'ari. Abul Hassan al-Ash'ari, before he became, before he came with this belief, he was a Mu'tazili. A Mu'tazili is a group before, Ibn, uh, before that sha'ira. His mother was married to a man of one of the biggest, most knowledgeable men of the Mu'tazila. His name was called Abu Ali al-Jubba'i. That was his father-in-law. One day him and uh, Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari had a discussion back and forth. Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, he didn't see a convincing answer from his father-in-law or his stepfather. صح? So he left what his father was upon. Or oh, his stepfather, uh, his stepfather was upon, and he dismissed the, the belief of the Mu'tazila, and he started to refute the Mu'tazila. Now, I want you to understand something: the refutation of the time was against the Mu'tazila. Everyone was refuting the Mu'tazila. Who was refuting the Mu'tazila? Ahmed bin Hanbal, uh, Abu Uthman al-Darimi. Everyone was Shafi'i. Everyone was refuting the Mu'tazila. They were hated. Everyone is against it. And who helps the, the, uh, the scholars of hadith who also adds on to refuting the Mu'tazila? Abdul Hassan Ash'ari. And he's one of the best people to refute them because he was one of them. And he knows their inside out, so he wrote books against them. So now listen to this. He's not the target. No one's looking at him. The, the battle is this way. This man is not part of the problem. So that's where the Ash'ara came from. And no one was focusing on them. Hence why you don't tend to find a lot of refutations on them or at, against them at that time because it wasn't them that was being dealt with. But as time went on, the Mu'tazila, the, 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 the refutation and the criticism really put them down. It destroyed them. It, it destroyed them. And so what happened? The Asha'ira became the dominant. Behind that silence, they just grew, grew, grew. And to be honest, from that time until Ibn Taymiyyah came, they were big. They were very big, very strong. Until he came, rahimahullah ta'ala, and he just flipped the table on them by himself, single-handedly. What was the time gap between this? Uh, from the origin of the ideology until the Taymiyyah? So it's a, around the 5th century. We're talking about at least... 4,500 years, roughly, where the idea was being pumped. And a lot of people were swallowing it. And he came, he went, look, he said, this is what you guys are saying. Let's go back to the original sources. Let's go back to where we, we should all go back to. Let's check what you guys are saying. Again, another thing people say is, okay, so everyone before Ibn Taymi didn't know, they, they were for falsehood? No, it's because... Two factors. Today, if I say something crazy, it goes on social media, everyone's going to see it. So there's going to be a quick response. Back then, there wasn't like that. It will take months and months, maybe years for people to hear about it. They might even hear about it one time, <coughs> once I die. Alhamdulillah. They might not even hear about it. Sah? 
So the world wasn't like, hello, what did he say? What's, what's the beliefs? What's happening there? It wasn't. So even if a group came out in one particular land, the rest of the other lands may not know about it. For a long time, they may not know about it. The point lacking here is, is that many scholars did not respond to them is because there's many factors. Some people just don't like the idea of fighting back. Some people, they don't like that. They just like to be quiet. Let me just give my da'wah. Leave me alone. I don't want to cause, I don't want to rock the boat. People are going to start hating me. So that's what a lot of people did. He didn't have that Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah was direct <coughs> and straight. So he took a lot of heat for it. Even the people who were with him, they didn't take that heat that he took. Who believed what he believed. They didn't take the heat that he took, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, for what he believed. Rahimahullah Rahmatan. That's why I say, it's like Allah sent him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to revive a re- yani the sunnah that was about to wear out. And as I said, you either like him or you hate him, but you're going to come across him in your life of Islamic studies. Nutaymi is not a figure you can ignore. You can't ignore him, rahimahullah ta'ala. Last question. Are they preserved somewhere? Will they be published? Because there is a lot of publishers who will be published by his name. So, how do we know it is a name in his book or somebody just. So, these are two questions. So, there is some books that were mentioned by Ibn Abdul Hadi we don't have. There are some name books that are mentioned. And we just don't have, the, he's saying, Ibn Taymiyyah wrote this book, we're like, where is it then? We just don't have it. So maybe a hundred years from now it pops up. Another thing is, his handwriting is known. Three, the content of the information that's in it. Four, the books get referenced by other people who wrote it from it. So sometimes we see the reference of this book, but we don't know where this reference was taken from. Until we actually find the book and we say, okay, Fulan referenced it. And, a, and referenced it back to Ibn Taymiyyah. It's a science. And it's not just Ibn Taymiyyah. Any works like that, it's an entire science where people, the concept of attribution of books. Like for example, the kitab, Tanbihul Rajul Al-Aqil Fi Tamwihil Jadal Al-Batil by Ibn Taymiyyah. When it came out, Dar al Fawaid, they got a lot of heat for it. Because a lot of scholars just said, this is not Ibn Taymiyyah's works. And that Al Fawaid had to come out with all of their efforts to show that this was written by Ibn Taymiyyah. So it's not like everyone just takes it, or oh, Ibn Taymiyyah wrote it, really, Jazakallah Khairan. There is a back and forth amongst the, the muhaqqiqeen, whether he wrote this book or, or whether he didn't. But I'll tell you something, and I'll conclude with this, inshallah ta'ala. It's sad, it's really sad that a lot of his works are in the lands of the non Muslims. British Museum, there's so much manuscripts. <coughs> I get phone calls from some, some of the scholars, they send me and they say to me, Abdurrahman, can you find this manuscript in the British Museum? Can you go to uh, Birmingham University and get this copy? Can you go to uh, Cardiff and get this copy from this particular place? Can you go to Germany and Berlin and get this copy? Oh, Berlin, Germany, I can't go there, I can't even speak German. But these works are taken. And Sheikh Mahmoud Shakir, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his kitab, Risala Fi Tariq Ila Thaqafati, no, no, Abatinu Wa Asmar. Mahmoud Shakir mentions that when the uh, French came into Egypt, they took the library of Al Jabarti, all of the manuscripts and everything, it was one of the biggest libraries in Egypt. And they stole, the, people just thought they stole money and the minerals and the resources of the country, like what the British did to India. They took all the resources and all the money and everything, right? But they also took manuscripts. They all took all these ar- the archives and everything. They, take, they stole everything, these people. And they put it in their, in their museums. And what's sad is that Muslims come and they travel to the Euro- UK and these countries and European countries. And guess where they go to? Parties and clubs and things like that. Are we all together? I mean, one of the guys that work in the British Museum said to me, why are there not many Muslims coming and visiting us? 
like why do why did they why don't they want this stuff? So, so yeah, when we go we we, we we go to to the country to see Big Ben and Eiffel Tower and yeah, London Bridge. Places I've never been to. <laughs> the 30 odd years of my life that I've been in the UK. Places I've never been to. People come to me and say to me, have you been there? I was like, I didn't even know it existed. Muslims should understand that I never travel to a country and go on sightseeing. I just go to the libraries and books that they have. A Muslim should not busy himself with the landscape. and It's good, don't get me wrong. Okay, قُلْ سِيرُ فِي الْأَرْضِ Before you can say to you, what about the ayah? قُلْ سِيرُ فِي الْأَرْضِ Of course, it's good to see the landscape, but don't, not buildings, though. Not buildings. So, do they allow these scholars to benefit from the Of course, they got what money? They took it from you because they want money. Oh, you're beautifully preserved. They're in glasses and they're fancy and it's... It, it looks at you like that and it costs like 10,000 pounds. Yeah, it costs money. It costs a lot of money to get those works from them. One of the books that we have, Kifayatul Akhyar, which is the Sharh of Kitab Mukhtasar, Kifayatul Akhyar by Al-Husni. It's, written, it's, one of the early, it's one of the beginner books for the Sharh of Matabi Shuja. Fiqh Shafi'i. The best publication, Darul Min Hajj published it. The best publication they got, they got it from Berlin, Germany. All the other copies were bad from Germany. Even Princeton University and Harvard and all of these universities, Cambridge and all of them, they have lots of lots of manuscripts. So many manuscripts. You want it, you have to pay money. You have to pay money. You can look at it if you want to, yeah. You just can't put your hand on the glass. And sometimes they don't let you take pictures of it. Well, a lot of the times they don't let you take pictures of it. So imagine, you take over a country, you add to your list of things that you need to take from what? Their works and their books. I'll tell you something I read. Aristotle, Alexander the Great, they call him, right? Was a student of who? Alexander, they say, was a student of Aristotle, right? Aristotle was his teacher. And he used to conquer countries and open lands. And yani, so He was their hero, the commander, the military. Aristotle said to him, and please remember this as long as you live. Aristotle said to him, if you ever go to a country and you take over, don't look for who is the ruler of the country. The ruler of the country is the one who writes music for them. The one who writes their music is a ruler. Meaning, the person who writes their language is the ruler of the country. The real ruler of the country is what? In other words, when the British and the American, uh, the British, they left India and they left other countries that they colonized, do you know what they left behind? The English language. A very powerful. One of the uh, I read in one of, one of the uh, journals that was written by one of the commanders that went to India, wrote a letter to his, the general. And he said to him, if we ever, be, the British, British, the Mujrimin, if we ever get put in a position where we have to choose between India and William Shakespeare, we're going to choose William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare is what? One person. India had... The resources, the money, the wealth, and everything that India had, right? Meaning, who really controls the world is the person whose language is spoken. Are we all together, brothers? I'm shocked. My jaw drops when I look at people who've never been to Western countries who speak English. I'm like, how? You guys are all in Kuwait. And a lot of you might say, I don't speak Arabic. How is it that you speak English then? That's, 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 that's what they wanted. Are we all together? I don't want to mention some countries because I don't, I don't want to be banned from going to it. <laughs> there's a law, there's, if you want to study the Arabic language, it's so much money. 
to study the English language, the British Council gives you basically no money. You can study English. Why? Why is the English language free? Why can, I, why can I study English language? Why are you guys willing to teach me the English language for free, basically? And the Arabic language is so expensive. So much money is charged for people to learn the Arabic language. Are we all together, brothers? I am telling you, as long as you are absent from the Arabic, the Arabic language, you're losing out so much. You are an outsider from your own religion. That you've chosen to do this to yourself. I will together. I was reading. I, I, I love reading about the importance of the Arabic language. I know I'm going off topic, but when the, uh, the Zionist government, Israel, wanted to, they wanted Palestine, and they took over Palestine. They didn't have a language. <coughs> Hebrew was not a spoken language. It was a written language. It was a script. It was just their, the, it was like their, 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 their Torah. But how would they turn the Torah's language into their day-to-day -day conversation? This was one of the aqabat that came, one of the obstacles that they had. Are we all together, brothers? They were not going to only take that language, but they had to actually go out of their way to turn it into a modern language which can keep up with technology, which can keep up with all the modern things. And write a dictionary. And, that's what they had to think of. Are we all together? Why are they, so, why are they going to put all that money and their effort and that resource and that time into that language? Why don't you just dismiss it and choose English as their... Why, why, why? Are we all together? They knew that language bonds them to what? Language is just more than... Language is more than words that come out of your mouth. It's what? It's a way of thinking. If you speak Arabic, I promise you, and someone records you, your body language is different from when you speak English, and your body language is different from when you speak your mother tongue language. The whole demeanor, your whole body. I study linguistics, that's my field of study. When I went to uni, I studied applied linguistics. That's what I did my postgraduate into, in University. This is one I wanted to know. Loga. This. We all together, brothers. As Muslims, if it wasn't the, if the Quran was not Arabic, the Arabic language would have gone a long time ago. But because the world is pegged on what what what, what currency? The dollar. The dollar is the the every currency was pegged on the dollar. Is that true? Yeah. The Arabic language is pegged on the Quran. That's what's preserving it. Because Allah is protecting the Quran, and the Quran will forever be protected, no one can change it, that's why the Arabic language will live forever. But the people of that language, I mean the Muslims, they abandoned it a long time ago. Are we all together, brothers? It's abandoned, it's abandoned. So, uh, inshallah, after this Torah, or these sessions that we're having, what are you guys all going to do? Learn the Arabic language. You're going to be a free man. Honestly. You're going to go to the ocean yourself and take from it. You're not going to need Muskeen Abdurrahman. And you're not going to need anybody else. If your father wrote you a letter and your father was a millionaire, a billionaire. And he wrote you a letter. And he died a day or two ago. And he wrote you a letter. And in there you could see some dollar signs and you could see something there. But it's in a language you don't understand. What would you do? What would you do with that letter? You wouldn't just translate it. You would not just translate it. You would get so many different people to translate it for you because you're worried that the first person might have told you something wrong. So, you're going to make sure that this information is... So, why? Because you want the, the dollar sign. So, how is that possible that the, the Quran that has better than a dollar sign. The salvation in this world and the hereafter is connected to it and you don't even want to know what's inside it. Sah? Ask yourself that question and think about it. Sah? So then the dollar sign is more important to you than the what? Your place in Jannah.